Martin Bacoli hands Tony Yoka his first professional defeat with a 10-round majority decision in Paris, France. And it is absurd that it was only a majority decision rather than a unanimous decision because this is one of the most one-sided points wins you will ever see. Totally one-sided, one-way traffic, far more one-sided, oh yes, far more one-sided than Bivol's win over Canelo. Now, this result poses a lot of questions. Before I get into the breakdown of the fight, let's just talk about some of the questions here. Because going in, you have Tony Yoka, who was 11-0, undefeated Olympic gold medalist, hadn't fought elite level opposition far from it. But for a guy with 11 fights, he had some decent names on the record, right? For a guy with so few fights, the likes of Jonathan Rice, who upset Michael Coffey. He had, of course, our very own Dave Allen, Dimitrenko, Michael Wallish, who was 20 and two at the time, Johan Duopa, who's normally a tough guy. Yoko got him out there and won. Christian Hammer, who's a tough guy again, beat him over 10 rounds. Joel Jekko, not sure who he was, but I did see that fight. Some dreadlocks guy who I've never seen fight before. Peter Milas, he was undefeated going in. And Tony Yoko managed to get him out of there in seven. So for a guy with 11 pro fights, an Olympic gold medal, etc., he was doing what he was supposed to do and he was looking relatively good. Why was he beaten in such one-sided fashion by Martin Bacoli? Because you look at Bacoli, here's a guy who had more fights, of course, going in, but he was stopped, beaten up, truthfully, and stopped by a cruiserweight in Michael Hunter back in 2018. You guys go revisit that fight. It's on YouTube. That was really a dominant display by Michael Hunter. Now, later on, Bacoli went on to fight Sergey Kuzmin, and that was back in 2020, more recently. For my money, Kuzmin won that fight. Martin Bacoli didn't look impressive. And Kuzmin, of course, another guy who has lost to Michael Hunter. And people are going to be wondering, scratching their heads now, thinking, is Hatman maybe right about Hunter, that he is a dark horse in the division and he will turn over at least one big name? Well, he's already turned over Martin Bacoli, right? <laughs> and he turned over Sergey Kuzmin, gave him his first loss, who was a tough guy too. But anyway, we won't talk about Hunter in this video. Let's focus on Yoka and Bacoli. So going into the fight, Martin Bacoli hadn't looked impressive of late and had been stopped by a cruiserweight before. So for him to go in there and completely dominate Tony Yoka, a six foot seven, a 30 year old Olympic gold medalist who hadn't put a foot wrong as a pro. What exactly does this mean? Does it mean that Martin Bacoli has improved massively over the past few months, the past two years since the Kuzman fight? Does it mean that it was simply a great style matchup for Martin Bacoli here against Tony Yoka? Does it mean that Yoka is simply nowhere near as good as people thought he was? Has Yoka been exposed here? What is it? Is it that Yoka is far worse than people thought or Bacoli is far better or some type of combination of the two? In terms of the way the fight played out, Martin Bacoli dominated this fight from start to finish. In the first round, it became apparent within, I want to say, 30 seconds that Tony Yoka was very wary of Martin Bacoli's power. And Bacoli was able to get to Yoka very easily. He had surprisingly fast hands here. For a guy who weighed his second heavy, weighed the second heaviest of his career at 200 and I think about 75 pounds, it doesn't give his weight here, perhaps because it was all in French and box rec don't have their French speakers to be able to interpret what the weight was, but I believe it was around 275 pounds. The stream that I watched had a British commentator, and I think he mentioned that Bacoli's weight was around 275. That is, as I say, the second heaviest of Bacoli's career. You would imagine at that kind of weight that he'd be slow. He wasn't exactly fleet of foot in this fight either, but his hand speed was fast. For me, his hands were faster than Tony Yoka's hands, and Yoka weighed 240, and he was athletic. And I do wonder, you know, whether Bacoli coming in this heavy was partly because of his time in camp with Tyson Fury. Because as we know, Fury put a lot of weight on after the Otto Wallen fight, and that was because he had been boiling himself down too low. And this is a guy who doesn't have the genetics to get ripped easily. Tyson Fury I'm talking about. So when you've got a guy who doesn't have the right genetics to get ripped easily, in attempting to get ripped, you may be depleting yourself. You may be 
leaving it all in the gym, basically, and not having enough energy and strength in the fight. Maybe his time in the Fury camp, that rubbed off on him and they told him, look, you're trying to take too much weight off. Don't worry about getting your weight down. You're a heavyweight, be big. Maybe that was the case. And maybe we saw the benefits of that for Martin Bacoli here against Tony Yoka. Because as I say, he wasn't slow in terms of hand speed. His foot speed was not the fastest you've ever seen, but in short bursts, Bacoli actually had decent foot speed as well. And his stamina was seemingly okay. Now, it's much easier to have good stamina when there's not much coming back. <laughs> yeah, pretty much any heavyweight could do a solid 10 rounds in the bag. It doesn't necessarily mean they're in the greatest of condition. When the shot's coming back and you're getting hit in the face and hit in the body, then we'll see what your stamina is really like. But when there's no real opposition, when there's nothing coming back at you, much easier to have good stamina. But either way, Bacoli was sharp on the counter. That's the first thing I took from this. Sharp on the counter. He was countering Tony Yoka's right hand with a left hook. He was countering Yoka's jab with a right hand over the jab, and he wasn't just sticking to single punches, he was combinating. So when he got through with a shot on Tony Yoka, he would then go downstairs to the body, back upstairs to the head. There was certain occasions where, again, he'd show surprising foot speed in short bursts, where he'd move off to the side to get a better angle to land another shot and continue his combination. And this was the case all throughout the fight. He even out-jabbed Tony Yoka in spots. I'm not saying he out-jabbed Tony Yoka overall, but there were certain moments in the fight where they were jostling for position, exchanging jabs, and Bacoli's jab was the better shot. It seemed the faster, more explosive jab and a more powerful jab. And it was rattling Tony Yoka's brains. <laughs> he realized very early on, this guy can knock me the F out. And Yoka didn't appear to have the power to hurt Bacoli at all. He couldn't get his respect. So Bacoli was just walking in, bullying him, hitting him with every shot in the book, Tony Yoka does have a pretty tight guard, but as I say, Bacoli was going down to the body. And by going down to the body, he was bringing that guard down and that forced Yoka to start moving around. Now, some people are going to say this was a cowardly performance by Tony Yoka because he really didn't try to win after a couple rounds. He just, as I say, ran around the ring and tried to survive. Even in the final round of 12th, he was just in survival mode. But I do have some sympathy for Yoka because Again, he realized early on that he couldn't hurt this guy, but Bacoli clearly could hurt him because Bacoli dropped him twice, dropped him in the first round. Yoka took a knee. His nose was bloody. I think he was cut as well later on in the fight. So Yoka was in there with a guy who he couldn't hurt, seemingly, but a guy who could hurt him and a guy who was sharp on the counter, a guy who was combinating, a guy who, let's be real, showed more skill in there than Tony Yoka, which is a surprising thing for me to be saying given the fact that this is an Olympic gold medalist, given the fact that Martin Bacoli was outboxed by Michael Hunter, didn't look good against Sergei Kuzmin, and Yoko was unbeaten going in. Martin Bacoli looked more skilled in there. His hands looked faster, like a sharper, better counterpuncher, made Tony Yoko look basic, made him look weak. The commentator that I was listening to, the one on the stream I was watching, an English commentator, he was talking about the possibility of Tony Yoka uh, mounting a late rally to salvage the fight, to try and either win by knockout or somehow score several knockdowns to get a decision. And he said he couldn't see that happening. And I certainly couldn't see it happen. It was, there was no moment in the fight where it looked like Tony Yoka was able to establish himself or get Martin Bacoli's respect or hurt him or buzz him in any way. Not even one moment. And by the way, his trainer, Virgil Hunter, was telling Tony Yoka to go for it. He was telling him, you got to knock this guy out, stop moving backwards, stand with him. And I think that Yoka thought about that in the corner and came out thinking, okay, let me do what Virgil's telling me to do. But as soon as he got hit clean <laughs> or half clean, he was like, oh, no, thank you. <laughs> hell to the no, no, to the no. You know that clip there? He was like, hell no. This guy hits way too hard for me to stand there with him. So if he had stood there with him, almost certainly would have been knocked out. And I guess Tony Yoka thought for his first loss, it's better to have a points decision loss rather than getting cleaned out in dramatic fashion. Perhaps he thinks that a points decision loss like that will be easier to get over, easier to come back from, from a psychological point of view, but also from a marketing point of view. You know, maybe they could just say, oh, well, we've put him in too early with Bacoli, who was more experienced at the time, you know, bigger, stronger. I'm sure they can 
find something they weren't happy about in camp and so on. Now, one of the things I forgot to mention with regards to Tony Yoka is some people are speculating, I'm just going to put it that way, that Yoka was on the juice earlier on in his career because he missed several tests. And of course, since this one-sided beatdown at the hands of Bacoli, people are saying, is this what Tony Yoka looks like when he's not on the juice? Now, what I'll say about that is I've got no idea. I'm not making any accusations here. But even if he was on juice for this fight, whether he was or he wasn't, I don't think it would have made any difference, to be honest with you, because it weren't just a case of Bacoli being the stronger guy. He was the more skilled guy. Go look at his counters. <laughs> the combinating, the head to body, the sharp jab, the footwork where he was moving off to the side to continue a combination where he get a better angle on him. All that stuff. Yoka just looked extremely basic. It'd be a difficult road back for Tony Yoka, but he is still relatively young in heavyweight terms. I know it says Martin Bacoli's 28 himself here, but <laughs> who really believes that Martin Bacoli is 28? Come on, people. Two years younger than Tony Yoka? Give it a rest. Yoka is 30, yes. Martin Bacoli's definitely not 28. This guy's probably closer to 38 than 28. <laughs> but Tony Yoka, young enough to come back, but they're going to need to match him a lot more carefully moving forward because the physical strength just was not there to keep a guy like Bacoli off. And shout out to Thibaut, by the way. He's a French guy who I've been speaking to online for many years. I've done several videos with him. He's got a YouTube channel called Jack, Jack Napier Boxing. I'm not sure if he still has that channel, but he told me behind the scenes many times that Tony Yokar had a reputation in the amateurs for being chinny. Apparently, he got knocked out badly on several occasions. And he said that he wasn't sure whether Yoka would get cleaned out in this fight here against Bacoli, but at some point he was expecting to see it. He was expecting to see Tony Yoka get knocked out in dramatic fashion. That didn't happen here, but only because Yoka showed survival skills, basically. That's what he showed. Some people might question his heart because he didn't go for it. Although, would you go for it when you're in there against a guy who you can't hurt, but who can hurt you and he can hit you with ease? Would you go for it against that guy? Or would you try and survive the 12? So again, let me know what you guys thought about the fight here. Were you one of the 80% of my subscribers that picked Tony Yoka to win? Why didn't it go the way most of us expected? Is it a case of Tony Yoka being exposed, being nowhere near as good as we thought he was? Or Martin Bacoli being a lot better than we thought he was? Why was Martin Bacoli dominated by Michael Hunter? Stopped. Why did he have that questionable decision over Sergey Kuzma just a couple fights back? Another guy who lost to Hunter, but that he comes in and defeats Tony Yoka with absolute ease. Why? What's going on there? Make it make sense. Let me know what you think in the comments, people.